Amelia Mary Earhart was a famous American aviator long before she disappeared on July 2nd, 1937. How did Lady Lindy, as she was often called in the press as a nod to America's other famous pilot, Charles Lindbergh, become so famous? What accomplishments did she achieve? And where the hell did she go? Where is she? Her disappearance is so well unsatisfying that 80 years later, we're still talking about it. And millions are still being spent trying to get to the bottom of this enduring 20th century mystery. Not knowing where she went after all she accomplished is like watching a great thriller, only to have the screen just go blank moments before the big wrap-up two hours in. So let's explore this mystery. Let's explore this amazing life. Let's suck old Amelia right on up in this girl power, second American badass we've sucked in the past three weeks edition of Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Praise Bojangles, yamo motherfucking time suck. And happy Monday, you irreverent and fun human being. Welcome to the cult of curiosity. Welcome to some learning fun time, facts, jokes, fascinating tales. I'm Dan Cummins, and this is Time Suck. Huge thanks to all the time suckers who've been gobbling up those new hats in the Time Suck shop, those 97% Komodo dragon toenail, 3% sea turtle wiener Time Suck hats. Been getting some great uh, pics of you time suckers wearing them, and, and just hearing about how much you like them. Appreciate that so much. If, if any merch took a bit to make it to you, thank Florida power outages caused by Hurricane Irma. All my merch uh, ships out of the Orlando area, despite me living in Idaho. Uh, thanks for all the continued emails. Uh, they mean so much. They really, really do. So many great topics flying into the show. Uh, we are never going to run out of good shit to suck, which is a statement that sounds terrible out of, out of context. And thanks for the iTunes reviews. And, uh, and for those of you who uh, use the Amazon button at uh, timesuckpodcast.com to help the show while you're doing your normal online shopping. The Suck is going to suck itself this Friday, October 6th, for the 1,000th review bonus edition, Suck. Excited to take a walk down memory lane, share how this whole thing uh, came about. And uh, the night before the 6th, I'll be doing the, the first live Time Suck in Hollywood, California at the Improv, October 5th. Stand-up show with the same Improv on October 6th. Coming right up, Helium Comedy Club in Portland, Oregon, October 12th through the 14th. Part of live in Bellevue, Washington, one night only, October 15th. Uh, Bananas Comedy Club in Hasbrook Heights, New Jersey, October 20th and 21st. And so much more coming up. I really hope you hit those uh, SoCal shows this uh, this uh, coming week. It's going to be my last ones in Southern California for the rest of the year. Uh, check the episode description for times and ticket links. Updates to previous episodes. Sneak peek at next week's episode at the end of this podcast. Time for Lady Fantastic. Amelia Earhart right now. So why are we still even talking about Amelia Earhart? Why did the History Channel do another documentary about the search for what happened to her just recently? It's been 80 years since she disappeared. Why do we care? Well, for one thing, uh, who doesn't love to try and solve a good mystery? All right, And also because uh, she led an incredible life and was incredibly famous in her day. America loves an explorer, an adventurer, a risk taker, someone who's not afraid to be the first to try something, the first to do it. Well, I say America. Uh, who the hell doesn't like an adventurer? Someone who challenges the status quo, isn't afraid to take some risk. Is there a country where people collectively hate that? God, I hope not. That would be, be a sad, kind of boring place to live. We here in Belgium appreciate mediocrity. We like the middle. We love a man or woman who isn't afraid to do what they're told and live the same life everyone else leads. We appreciate the, the person who never gets noticed, never rocks the boat. Never draws attention to themselves. Now, if you'll excuse me, I, I, I feel self-conscious even speaking this long without letting others have something to say. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head home and watch whatever show is the most popular and, and get to bed early. Uh, if you're from Belgium, I know that that is a shit accent. I didn't even, I didn't even look up how someone from Belgium speaks. That was, uh, that was a, an accent unto itself. That person was from nowhere. <laughs> and I did pick you completely at random as a nation. You, you know what? You may be some exciting chocolate-making motherfuckers for all I know. I don't know. I don't know much of anything about you, uh, but I do know a little bit about Amelia Earhart. So let's take a good look at her life and start at the beginning with a time suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Amelia Mary Earhart was born in Atchison, Kansas on July 24th, 1697. She'd fly her first plane shortly after losing her father in the American Revolutionary War in 1756. She herself uh, would fight in the Civil War in both 1810 and again in 1910, and then one more time in 1976. Now, clearly, if you're a longtime listener, you know that all of that was bullshit. She didn't fight in the Civil War. In years, the Civil War didn't happen, and when she would have been, according to the numbers I just threw out, uh, around 300 years old in the last battle. 
Uh, if you're a new listener, uh, no, I did not have a stroke, and no, it's not going to all be like this. And if for any reason all of that seemed legit to you, oh, dear God, if you found the right podcast, you could definitely use a little bit of learning. Okay, for real this time. Uh, Amelia Mary Earhart was born in Atchison, Kansas on July 24th, 1897, uh, a town that would also produce uh, early rock and roll pioneer Jesse Stone, a bunch of politicians no one cares about, and Rory Lee Feek, one half of the country duo Joey and Rory, who I refuse to listen to based on almost uh, based on almost entirely on a picture I found of Rory uh, wearing overalls as an almost 50-year-old man at a country music award show. Seriously, overalls? Did you just head to the award show uh, straight uh, uh, from the fucking farm? Stop it. Stop it. You're a musician. Stop dressing like a goddamn farmer. Uh, Atchison is a town of uh, about 10,000 people on the Missouri River, uh, roughly 50 miles northwest of Kansas City, and it was originally uh, the eastern terminus of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railways. Uh, It's also the home of Benedictine College, and every July hosts the Amelia Earhart Festival, where men can put their wives on a small plane, wave goodbye, and know for sure that the women will disappear and never be seen again. It's very popular. Now, that would be horrible, uh, and also kind of amazing for some people. It does have that festival, though. Amelia was born to Samuel Edwin Stanton Earhart, a lawyer by education, and Amelia Amy Otis Earhart. Uh, in 1899, Amelia's sister Grace Muriel Earhart was born as a, as a young girl, Amelia Earhart, or Mealy, as her family called her, lived with her grandparents most of the year in Atchison, Kansas, while her father worked as a claims agent for the railroads, and her mother traveled with him. And they would say in Kansas City, Amelia and her younger sister Grace, who went by Muriel or Pidge, uh, went to private school in Atchison and then spent the summers also, you know, with the parents in Kansas City. In her autobiography, uh, Amelia looked back on her early childhood as a very happy time because she was continually surrounded by family members who loved her and had a variety of cousins, playmates. She was also apparently fascinated with uh, travel at an early age. One of Amelia's favorite games, uh, she called Boogie, uh, involved crouching in an old carriage in her grandparents' barn while pretending to travel to foreign countries. That makes sense to me, man. Her parents are gone all the time, and her grandparents are probably telling her about her mom and dad and this place or that place, and uh, she's going to naturally, you know, be drawn to a traveling lifestyle. Though she didn't travel to other continents until she started flying much, much later, she did uh, travel a lot around the states as she grew up. Amelia once said, uh, because I selected a father who was a railroad man, it was my fortune to roll. (laughs) Uh, Amelia traveled throughout the country as a kid, visiting states as far away as California. Uh, an early family trip to a fair in St. Louis sparked Amelia's interest in new inventions, kind of showed her adventurous side. I uh, love this. Uh, she was so thrilled by a ride on a roller coaster at the fair uh, that she tried to build her own roller coaster back at her grandma's house in Atchison. Uh, Mealy and her cousins constructed a track, ran it from the roof of the woodshed all the way down to the ground, and she hopped on and, and went for a ride. I love this childhood sense of adventure, man. Uh, the car was a board placed on roller skates. Amelia went down in the car, which uh, flipped over as it hit the ground, of course. I guess she didn't get hurt too bad, but you know she had to, she had to give up because her mom and grandma thought you know maybe maybe a homemade roller coaster maybe not the, maybe not the best idea maybe a recipe for broken limbs maybe a broken neck uh, I'm guessing they were surprised that she could even make it work at all I feel like if my kids asked me if they could make a homemade roller coaster I might actually say yes just thinking that there is no way in hell they would build anything that would even remotely work uh, Amelia was also uh, a very always just very adventurous. As one of uh, her childhood friends recalled, Mealy was the instigator who would dare to try anything. We would all follow along. That had to have been so fu- that had been so much fun, trying out that homemade roller coaster as a kid, man. Just sitting on the top of that shed, looking down, just the adrenaline. I never built anything like that as a kid, but I, I did figure out that if you ran and jumped off of the doghouse, like if you put the doghouse I had uh, about eight feet in front of the basketball hoop, you know, and you got a full sprint, you could kind of Michael Jordan it off with that dog shed roof and just slam dunk it, right? I mean, this neighborhood kid, Johnny Pottinger, man, we wore that dog house out. Like, we literally just eventually just stepped through it and just destroyed it. Doing our Michael Jordan dunks. Uh, 1908, when Amelia was 11, the family moved to Des Moines, Iowa. Gross. That's fucking gross. Would have been better if they just all died rather than having to go to Des Moines. Jesus. Worst city ever on the planet. Almost the, the worst, the worst. Uh, there was a study taken, and it was the worst city in, in all of the world. I'm kidding. I have no strong feelings about Des Moines. But a comedy club there a few times. I couldn't tell you one thing about that city. Just for a second, I just felt like some riling up the Des Moines listeners. Just people kept writing in. What the fuck was that about? Uh, Amelia and Muriel uh, started splitting time between her grandparents' home in Kansas and her parents' new home in Des Moines. I guess her dad was pretty careless with money. Also started developing quite the, the drinking habit around this time. And when he was uh, out of work or out of money, Amelia and her sisters would head back to grandma and grandpa's house. Uh, 1907 at the Iowa State Fair, Amelia saw her first airplane, and she described it as a thing of rusty wire and wood. So, you know, it wasn't, wasn't love at first sight between Amelia and aviation. Uh, the plane didn't impress her at the time, but she, she had yet to see one flying around in the sky. 
Uh, other moves throughout the Midwest followed as her dad moved from job to job. 1911, Amelia's grandmother, Amelia Otis, who had been helping raise her and her sister in Atchison, uh, she died. And after her, her death, her father began to drink more uh, heavily than ever and eventually lost another job. Well, Grandma Otis uh, left Amelia's mother a small fortune, but due to Edwin's alcoholism, she didn't make it readily available to them. Uh, it had to be, you know, uh, kind of accessed throughout a trust fund that would just dole it out little by little. And the girls now go to live full time uh, with their financially struggling parents. 1913, Edwin gets a job in St. Paul, Minnesota, right next to Minneapolis, one of the twin cities. The family moves north. 1914, in the spring of 1914, Edwin took yet another job in Springfield, Missouri. But after moving, discovered that the man he was to replace had decided not to retire. Uh, that had to have been slightly annoying. Just, uh, oh, so so you're not going to retire and, and let me have the job that I, I moved my entire family uh, just to Springfield to take that I moved them from one state to another to take you, you're not going to then let me have that you you realize we moved here only for that right and now you're just not gonna you're not gonna give it to me well I guess uh guess who's gonna get drunk for a long time now uh, rather than return to Kansas with Edwin uh, where he eventually left the railroad business and started his own law practice Amy left Edwin uh, whose drinking problem had getting you know more and more out of hand she took her kids to live with some friends in Chicago's Hyde Park neighborhood Amelia's shame and humiliation over her dad's alcoholism and the family's financial struggles that her dad's drinking created gave her a lifelong uh, disdain, uh, dislike for alcohol, and need for financial security. Well, uh, Earhart uh, graduated from Hyde Park High School in 1915 and then attended a finishing school in Philadelphia, the Ogant School the following year, which was kind of, kind of a junior college for women. Her ultimate goal was to attend Bryn Mawr, uh, a prominent women's liberal arts college in southeast Pennsylvania, and then Vassar. Uh, Bryn Mawr had also uh, recently become the first college in the U.S. to offer doctorates in social work in 1912, and Vassar in Poughkeepsie, New York, was the first degree-granting institution of higher education for women in the United States. Both schools on the cutting edge of women's higher education. So Amelia, clearly a motivated young woman who took her education seriously. Over uh, Christmas break during her second year at Ogantz, uh in 1917, she visited her sister in Toronto, Canada, where Muriel was attending St. Margaret's College. Uh, Earhart encountered many World War I veterans there, and although she was already kind of helping with the war effort at Agans uh, as secretary of the Red Cross chapter there, she wanted to do more, so she left Agans to uh, volunteer as a nurse in Spadina uh, Military Hospital in Toronto, where, where many of the patients were French, English pilots. She and Muriel also spent time at a local airfield watching the Royal Flying Corps train, and her fascination with flight really began to take off. Uh, pun not intended, but recognized and not erased. 1918, during the influenza pandemic of 1918 and 1919, uh, which did sweep through Toronto in the summer of 1918, Earhart contracted a severe sinus infection that required surgery, which sounds very painful. I don't know if you've ever had sinus infections. Uh, I've had several of them. And one that requires surgery, just ah, uh, just imagine just a dull ache. It would feel like your head just wanted just, it was rotting out from the inside, I'm sure, before you had to get that surgery. Lengthy recovery period. Uh, that fall, she goes to live with her mom and sister in Northampton, Massachusetts, where her sister was preparing to attend Smith College, another early premier women's college. Sylvia Plath, author of The Bell Jar, uh, Chef Julia Child, activist Gloria Steinem, former First Lady Nancy Reagan, Orange is the New Black author Piper Kerman, and uh, many other notable alumni have come from Smith. Smith College only accepts female undergraduates to this day, actually. Uh, during Amelia's convalescence, she completed a course in automobile maintenance. Very uncommon for women. Uh, Earhart, Earhart, excuse me, uh, girls didn't fuck around, man. Uh, she, was, she was always drawn to fields that were traditionally masculine. She didn't care what the status quo was. Definitely an early feminist before that was even a term people really threw around. In the fall of 1919, uh, Earhart enrolled in a pre-med program at Columbia University in New York City with plans to become a doctor. And although, although she did well academically starting off there, she left after a year to rejoin her recently re reconciled parents uh, who had moved to Los Angeles, California. So she dropped out. She headed west. And then it was uh, Los Angeles where Earhart saw her first air show and took her first plane ride. She'd later say, as soon as we left the ground, I knew I had to fly. That's how I felt the first time I mocked some poor other human being as a kid. Like, as soon as I mock someone, I was like, I got to do more of this. How can I get on stage and mock society in general? Uh, man, flight lessons. I have never had the slightest interest in that. I barely trust myself to drive a car. Uh, right or wrong, I feel like in a car, there is less chance that I'm going to die if I make a mistake. And I make a lot of mistakes. Uh, and, and, I, and I do know statistically, you're, you're more likely to die in a car than a plane overall. But I think that's probably... Probably becomes because people are, are more often in cars. That's partly what I think. 
maybe that's not maybe that's not true. I am speculating right now. Uh, I I do think though when it comes to crashes, you have way more uh, you're way more likely to die in, in like a plane crash than a car crash. Like if the vehicle does crash, got to be way more likely to die in a plane. Not a lot of minor fender benders in the sky. Not a lot of you know people somewhat calmly getting out, exchanging insurance information, and getting back in their planes after the planes collide. Just oh dude, look what you did to my wing. Fuck, I just. I just got this plane. Now my wing is all mangled. It's going to be in the, in the shop for weeks. Damn it. No, I think it's pretty much just an uh, explosion, a lot of flames, or uh, a lot of screaming at the very least uh, when planes hit, and then a lot of twisted metal hitting the ground, and then uh, a, a lot of, yeah, just a lot of, a lot of shock and horror. Uh, no thanks. I'm, I'll play a flight simulator, and I'll just call it a day. Uh, Amelia began taking lessons uh, at Burt Kenner's Airfield on Long Beach Boulevard from Netta Snook on January 3rd, 1921, out there in California. Uh, Snook gave her lessons in a rebuilt Canuck, the Canadian version of the Curtis JN4 Jenny, which proved to be lumbering and slow for Earhart, and by the summer she had a, she had a bright yellow Kenner Air Star that she called the Canary. To help pay for the plane and flying lessons, she worked at a photography studio and, uh, and as a filing clerk at the Los Angeles Telephone Company. And she was also the first woman in uh, west of the Mississippi to sell crack ever. Yep, she uh, sold crack for about three years from what I read in my head. No, that would be fucking crazy, all right? <laughs> what a story that would be. Amelia Earhart funding her early avi- aviation career selling crack cocaine before that was even invented. Uh, Netta Snook, her instructor, is an interesting character and kind of another uh, early aviation pioneer. Not kind of, definitely. She, she'd actually uh, later write a popular book ta- titled I Taught Amelia to Fly. Only a year older than Amelia, born in 1896 in Illinois, Snook began attending uh, Iowa State College, now Iowa State University, in 1915, taking courses in mechanical drawing, engines, farm machinery repair, you know, typical lady stuff for 1915. Uh, she became fascinated with literature related to aviation, soon wanted to learn how to fly. During her sophomore year in college, uh, Snook applied to the Curtis Wright Aviation School in Newport News, Virginia, was denied admittance. admittance. Uh, no women were being allowed at the time. The following year, an advertisement for the Davenport Flying School in Iowa brought her back home, and she became one of the first female student pilots there. And then in 1917, the tenacious Snook eventually did gain entry into the Curtis Wright Aviation School and put in uh, as many hours in the air as she could until civilian flights in the U.S. were banned for the duration of World War I. Uh, briefly, in 1918, she worked for the British Air Ministry in Elmira El- El- as an expediter, uh, putting her mechanical skills to good use, inspecting and, and testing aircraft parts and engines on their way out to combat in Europe. After purchasing a wrecked Canuck, uh, Snook had it shipped back to Ames, Iowa, and spent two years rebuilding the aircraft in her parents' backyard. What the fuck? That is a skill set I c- cannot even begin to comprehend. Just building a plane in the yard. No, and then, no way. There's no way I trust myself to build a plane and then fly it. Yeah, if I ever had to build a plane, well, guess who's never going to fly that thing? Uh-uh. You hop in if you trust me. I don't. Uh, 1920, Snooks uh, soloed in her real rebuilt Canuck, flying around a nearby pasture, then received her pilot's license, and shortly after, entry into the Aero Club of America and the Federation Aer- uh, Aeronautic International, FAI, barnstorming throughout the Midwest in her Canuck. She made a living, kind of furtively hauling sightseers and passengers, although her license didn't technically allow passengers. Then, with the onset of a, of a bitter Iowa winter, Snook decided to head up to California, where she could fly year-round. She disassembled the Canuck for shipping and ended up in balmy Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Uh, learning about Snook made me wonder, who was the first woman in the world to fly? Well, before this time suck, I assumed it was Amelia Earhart. I uh, didn't know a lot about aviation history before this uh, time suck. Well, it wasn't. It was, it was your mom. It was your fucking mom, okay? Your mom was the first woman to fly. And if you don't like that, you're just, you're just you know, you're just not cool with uh, knowing truth, I guess. You didn't know that, did you? No, the first woman was uh, known to fly was Elizabeth Thibble, who I strongly doubt was your mom. Highly doubt it, because she was born about 250 years ago. She was a passenger in an untethered hot air balloon, which flew above Lyon, France, France, <laughs> Lyon, France, in 1784. Four years later, uh, Jan Lebras became the first woman to fly solo in a balloon and become the first woman to parachute as well. In June uh, 1903, Ada de Acosta, an American woman vacationing in Paris, convinced Alberto Santos Dumont, a pioneer of dirigibles, to allow her to pilot his airship. Becoming probably the first woman, you know, to pilot a motorized aircraft. And then there was Catherine Wright, 
Sister of the Wright Brothers. The first machine-powered flight was accomplished by the Wright Brothers on December 17, 1903, and both brothers felt that it was important to recognize the contributions of Catherine Wright to their work. Catherine, while she didn't fly with her brothers until later in 1909, knew, quote, everything about the workings of their machines. Kind of fucked up that they went with the Wright brothers, you know, instead of the Wright family, considering that. Catherine must have been a little disappointed with that decision. Just, uh, the, the Wright brothers, huh? The Wright brothers. That's what you're, that's what you're gonna go with. Uh, why don't you just call yourselves the fuck you Catherines, hmm? Hmm? Why don't you just, why don't you just call yourselves the we don't appreciate our sister brothers? Why don't you call yourselves the two dick faces, dick face twins? Uh, the first woman passenger in an airplane was a woman whose name I have no idea how to say, and neither does anyone else. It's, ri- it's ridiculous. I couldn't find a video or audio file for it. She's not a major historical figure. It's, it's hard because her first name is M-L-L-E. Like, there's no, apparently there's no vowel in between the M and the L there. Like who's, who spells their name like that? It's Mul, Mul, P. von Pottelsberg de la Potterie. Uh, who flew with Henry Farman on several short flights in an air show in Ghent, Belgium, between May and June uh, 1908. Uh, soon after, in July 1908, sculptor uh, Therese Pelletier uh, was taken up as a passenger by Léon de la Grange, and within a few months had been reported as making a solo flight in Turin, Italy, flying around 200 meters in a straight line, about two and a half meters off the ground. And then there was Blanche Scott. Blanche always claimed to be the first American woman to fly an airplane. Uh, but as she was seated when a gust of wind uh, took her up on the brief flight in September 1910, the accidental flight kind of went unrecognized. <laughs> so she's just sitting in the plane, and a strong gust of wind came. She got a little bit of fucking airborne, and then she was like, did it. Checked, checked in the box. Did it. Uh, however, within two years, Blanche uh, had established herself as a daredevil pilot for real and was known as the tomboy of the air, competing in air shows, exhibitions, as well as flying circuses. On October 13th, 1910, another early female pl- uh, pilot, Bessica Raish, received a gold medal from the Aeronautical Society of New York, recognizing her as the first American woman to make a solo flight. So maybe that's who did it, right? There's all these, all these people dispute it, you know? Just because this person was recognized doesn't mean another person didn't kind of do it on their own in an un- unrecognized manner a little bit before, but probably Bessica. That's a weird name, man. Apparently she went by Bessie. I bet she did. Probably got tired of constantly correcting people. Uh, uh, Jessica? No, 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 it's, uh, it's Bessica. Jessica? Uh, no, Bessica. Like Jessica, but with a B. Is that a family name? Uh, no, just some dumb shit my parents made up at the hospital. What do they care? They wouldn't have to be the ones to correct everyone they met for the rest of their fucking lives. And yes, that is how Bessica talked. Half of that name gave her the saltiest of salty sailor tongues. Uh, Harriet Quimby became the USA's uh, uh, first licensed female pilot on August 1st, 1911, and the first woman to cross the English Channel by by airplane the following year. Thirteen days after Quimby, her her friend Matilda E. Mossin, uh, an American of French-Canadian descent, was licensed and began flying in air shows. She'd break a world altitude record in 1911. So, you know, while America Earhart was definitely, uh, would definitely go on to become like the most famous early female aviator, far from the actual first. And if I would have figured this out earlier, I guess I would have never done this stupid episode, would I? What the fucking point of this? What, why am I learning about someone right now if they weren't the first and they weren't the best? I'm so mad right now. <sighs> guess we'll go on with this boring stuff. I'm kidding, of course. Kidding, of course. Yes, there were other female aviators, and Amelia uh, would crush a lot of their records. She was very, very good at what she did. And she took her publicity a lot further than her peers, you know, by doing the whole mysterious disappearance thing. If they wanted their careers to go a little further, maybe they should have disappeared forever, okay? She was willing to take it to the next level. Now, back to Snook and Earhart, uh, Earhart uh, back in 1921. I hate it when people's names are so phonetically different than how they're spelled. Because I have to, I have to, I have to put, I have to mentally put air every time I come across information that has her name in it, even though it's pronounced ear. Ear heart is how it's, how it's spelled exactly. But it's Earhart. Uh, Snook thought Earhart was ready to fly solo after 20 hours of flight training. Generally, 10 hours were deemed sufficient at the time, but Earhart insisted on having stunt training before flying alone. Remember, she was adventurous. And then Amelia uh, began participating in public aerial demonstrations and air rodeos. I love that that's a term, an air rodeo. Then in the fall of 1922, just a year after learning to fly, she set an unofficial altitude record for women flying to 14,000 feet. And then on March 17th, 1923, she received top billing for the air rodeo and opening event at Glendale Airport in Glendale, California. The student becomes the teacher. Top billing. The girl who had built a homemade roller coaster as a kid was a natural daredevil. 
All right, unfortunately, due to a change in the Earhart family's fortune, uh, her dad was still blowing family dough on the old whiskey fire water, and Amelia wasn't making much money at air rodeos, uh, which every time I say it makes me picture a tiny plane in the center of all the other planes with a little rodeo clown in it. For some reason, just a little rodeo clown plane in the middle of the other planes. Earhart, uh, she had to sell her precious Air Star in, ni- in 1923 in June, and her aviation dreams would have to kind of wait a little bit as life got in the way as it sometimes does. 1924, Amelia's parents divorce. Earhart moves back to the East Coast. She had been pissed about that. I moved it. I dropped out of med school to be with you guys, getting back together, and now you're just done again, you sons of bitches. Uh, she moves back to the East Coast with her mom and sister, settling in Boston, Massachusetts, where she worked at the Denison House, teaching English to immigrant families. She became a full-time live-in staff member at Denison House, which provided uh, social services, you know, an education to the urban poor by having educated women live with them. Noble job, noble job, but I'm guessing Amelia was a little depressed to be doing it, a little depressed about this life change, right? Just I, I know having your own plane and dreaming of smashing you know, continually smashing aviation records was, was fun. That was a fun, you know, kind of dream to have. And how, but how much more fun is it to live with immigrant families and teach them how to order a hot dog or root for the Red Sox or how to say, golly gee, Bob, isn't that swell? Which, which is more fun? Teaching English to incoming Hungarians fleeing recently war-torn Europe in the, in, in the cold winter of Boston or feeling the warm wind blow through your hair as you soar above the orange groves and the beautiful beaches of Southern California. Which, which, which one is kind of a toss-up? Uh, well, uh, by 1928, she's back in the flight game. Uh, she'd been making friends with local aviation enthusiasts on the East Coast, and in 1928, she was invited to join pilot Wilmer Bill Stoltz. Uh, you know what? He, he would do some cool stuff here. There's a reason he didn't get famous, and I'm going to say it's his name. Charles Lindbergh. That's a, that's a fucking aviation name. Who's that pilot? That's Charles Lindbergh. You, that's who that is. Pay your respects. Very different than, who, who's that other guy? That's Wilmer, St- <laughs> that's Wilmer Stultz is who that guy is. That is Wilmer, that is Wilmer, that's the best pilot in America. Wilmer Stultz. Gonna be a lot of Wilmers being named coming up because of that guy. No. Uh, but anyway, she was invited to join pilot Wilmer Stultz and co-pilot mechanic uh, Louis E. Slim Gordon, oh, Slim and Wilmer, as a passenger on their transatlantic flight set to take place a little over a year after Charles Lindbergh's uh, landmark flight, and she would become the first woman to ever fly across the Atlantic. Woohoo! Take that, immigrant families. Why don't you, fuck, why don't you figure out how America works on your own? On June 17th, 1928, uh, they, the, the, the trio left Newfoundland, in a Fokker F7, and about 21 hours later, arrived in Buryport, Wales. The successful flight made headlines around the world in no small part because book publisher and publicist George P. Putnam was involved in the project. He was a successful publisher, very familiar with the aviation industry. He's already working with Charles Lindbergh, publishing his work, and he knew Amelia's involvement in this flight would be great for press. Well, George would later become Earhart's uh, manager and eventually her husband. A ticker tape parade in New York City and a reception at the White House by President Calvin Coolidge catapulted the crew of this flight to fame and introduced the name Amelia Earhart to the American public. And then, of course, the other two guys kind of faded away to obscurity because they didn't get better names. Although, although Earhart was just a passenger, in her own words, she was a sack of potatoes, the trip set the stage for Earhart to become a pioneer of aviation and a true American celebrity. By the end of the year, Putnam had arranged for her first book to be published, titled 20 Hours, 40 Minutes, Our Flight in the Friendship, the American girl, first to cross the Atlantic by air, tells her story. Man, do they get uh, they get paid by the by the letter and titles back then? That's a long ass title. God, man, titles have really evolved. That's a terrible title, but I guess it did well. Uh, and then in early 1929, George and Earhart released a sex tape. Yeah, Amelia never even took off her dress in the video, and George barely lowered his pants, uh, barely, barely lowered his trousers. It only lasted a few minutes. It was the missionary position the entire time. Not a word was spoken, nor eye contact made. Nary a groan was heard, but it was very scandalous for the time. And extraordinary, since actual video had not been invented yet, so of course it didn't happen. Hail Nimrod! Drank a lot of coffee today. Uh, 1929. August 1929, the Cleveland Air Race, uh, Air, transcontinental race, uh, was opened to women as a nine-stage race that began in Santa Monica, California, and ended in Cleveland, Ohio. That seems a little anticlimactic. Nothing against Cleveland. But, you know, you'd probably, you'd probably rather go Cleveland than Santa Monica. Uh, in the Women's Air Derby, uh, dubbed the Powder Puff Derby by humorist and, well, uh, chauvinist uh, Will Rogers, 
Uh, Powder Puff, that's got a little demeaning. Earhart piloted a new Lockheed Vega 1, the heaviest of the planes flown in her class. God, that must have actually pissed those women off, man. So patronizing. Oh, that's cute. You're going to do your little fly thingy. Just kind of like the men, but slower. <laughs> Adorable. Well, make, make sure you put on your pretty makeup and get your nails did just right, you silly, pretty little things, you. I'm guessing Amelia was not the type of woman who thought of her races as powder puff races. Probably wanted to take a powder puff and just shove it as far as she could up Will Rogers' ass. Uh, due to several mishaps and one fatality, uh, do people die in powder puff races, Will? Only 16 to 20 pilots completed the race. Uh, Louise Staden won the Class D race with the Beechcraft Travel Air Speed Wing. Gladys O'Donnell came in second with the Waco ATO. And Earhart came in third in her Vega. Two hours behind the winner. So as badass as Earhart was in a plane, there were other female badasses flying around at the time. Did not know that. Never had so many female pilots spent a significant amount of time together or gotten to know each other so well. And because of the camaraderie and support they felt during the race, Thaden, O'Donnell, Earhart, Ruth Nichols, Blanche Noyes, and Phoebe Omley uh, gathered to discuss forming an organization for female pilots, the first of its kind, and they called themselves Labia, the lady aviators belonging to international aviation. No, no, they did not. But the 11-year-old inside of me thinks that is hilarious. No, they called themselves the 99s. Uh, all 117 of the women pilots uh, licensed at the time were invo- invited to join. That's how they got the name. On November 2nd, 1929, 26 women, including Earhart, met at the uh, Curtis Airport in Valley Stream, New York, to form the organization named for the 99 charter members. Earhart was the first president of the organization. So despite not winning that derby, she was clearly a leading aviator of her day. Uh, While following Putnam's Putnam's divorce from his first wife, Dorothy Binney, in 1929, his professional relationship and friendship with Earhart developed into a romantic one. After numerous marriage proposals, Earhart finally accepted, and they were married on February 7th, 1931. Uh, Earhart called the marriage a partnership with dual control. She actually uh, (laughs) uh, did something kind of unheard of for the day. She, um, She made him agree to do a trial marriage for that first year. And then if it lasted after the, you know, year... Then they would kind of consolidate, you know, their assets. But that first year, they kept everything separate. That's just well, let's 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 make sure this works. She was no powder puff, Amelia. Powder puff, by the way, when used as an adjective, has two meanings. One is a uh, a sport played by women or girls only, and the second meaning is ineffective. So how derogatory is that term? Uh, after the marriage, Putnam continued to manage Earhart's career, arranging her flying engagements which were often followed by lecture tours to maximize the opportunity for publicity. And not only did she take, uh, not take, excuse me, his last name when they married, he would become known publicly as Mr. Earhart as her fame grew. Also clearly very uncommon. Uh, on April 8th, 1931, Earhart set an altitude record in a Pitcairn auto uh, gyro, kind of a type of early helicopter that would stand for years. This thing looks terrifying, by the way. If you want to Google uh, auto gyro, it is I would never get in one of these. It had the big overhead blade of a helicopter combined with the body of an early two-seater plane. It has to kind of look like if you went to the airport, any airport, walked out of the gate and were led to this type of contraption, any reasonable person who cares about their life would say something to the effect of, no, 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 there's, there's, there's no fucking way I'm climbing into that death trap. No, n- no, absolutely not. Amelia was sponsored by the, the Beach Nut Company in an attempt to be the first uh, pilot to fly in auto gyro from coast to coast, but discovered on arrival that another pilot had accomplished the feat a week before. Damn it. The Beach Nut Company, by the way, is an Amsterdam-based corporation still around that primarily makes baby food today. But years ago, they made all kinds of stuff, man. Po- possibly out of beech nuts, I guess, maybe. I, I can't confirm that. But you can find old advertisements for beech nut bacon, beech nut peanut butter. That's confusing to me. Do you make beech nut peanut butter out of beech nuts or peanuts? Or both. They had beech nut ketchup, uh, beech nut marmalade, beech nut <laughs> chewing gum. So much beech nuts. And you and you know, you know, the funny guys, the funny guy <laughs> at the bar across America uh, had something to say about this sponsorship. <laughs> Amelia is sponsored by beech nuts. <laughs> uh, I'd like to, I'd like to sponsor her with with my nuts. <laughs> Cue loud, drunken guffawing and knee slapping. Oh. Oh, people and their, and their humor sometimes. Uh, I've never eaten uh, any beech nuts, to my knowledge, uh, but it seems like people loved it. Where the hell did they go? Uh, even though beech nuts actually do produce a small edible nut, I can't find any, any information about people eating them. So I think it was just a company name. And I don't think beech nuts actually went into any of the products, which is strange to me. Like, then why, why, like, like why would you name 
Like if you're if you're making peanut butter, why would you have the the name on the jar of peanut butter be a different food? Technically, you know that's very confusing. That's like naming your company tomato. Your company is tomato, and you sell canned pineapples. So confusing. Uh, you know what's not confusing? Today's sponsor. Let's talk about Bombfell. Right, Time Suck is brought to us today by Bombfell. I hate shopping for clothes, but I love getting awesome clothes. That's why I use Bombfell. Bombfell is an online personal styling service that helps men find the right clothes specifically for them. You don't just get whatever other dude is getting that month. Uh, it's not going to be a flavor of the month. Now You're not going to be one of 10 dudes wearing the same outfit in the office next week like a jackass. No, sir. Bombfell is very simple, very straightforward. All you have to do is complete a questionnaire and a dedicated personal stylist will handpick pieces specifically for you. Then once you've viewed your selections, you'll have 48 hours to make any changes or even cancel altogether. You're in total control and you only pay for the clothes you keep. Plus, you have the option of receiving clothes, you know, like once every uh, one, two, or three months. Bombfell doesn't make money if you don't find something you want to keep. I got a, I got a, a pair of a Big Star Archetype Blue Denim Slim Jeans. Love them. Been wearing them on stage a lot lately. Also wearing the Descendants of Thieves Sick T-shirt. And uh, Jeremiah Fillmore Reversible Plaid Shirt I got from Bombfell. Uh, Bombfell wearing that on stage as well. Uh, all picked up by my stylist, Jasmine, who walked me through an incredibly easy shopping experience, man. I love Bombfell, and you will too. And all right, here's the best part, the Time Suck discount. Time Suckers get a special offer of $25 off your first purchase when you go to bombfell.com slash Time Suck. That's Bombfell, spelled B-O-M-B-F-E-L-L dot com slash Time Suck. B-O-M-B-F-E-L-L dot com slash Time Suck. All right, back to Amelia breaking some flight records. Uh, Since the coast-to-coast flight had already been accomplished, Amelia decided to attempt the first transcontinental round-trip flight in an autogyro because she was insane, and she didn't make it. Of course not. The the autogyro crashed after taking off in Abilene, Texas, on the return leg of the trip, uh, and then she received a reprimand for negligence from Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Aviation, Clarence Young, (laughs) Who probably was just like, why are anybody flying in these? Although she went on the, uh, she went on and completed the trip in a new autogyro, uh, she abandoned the rotocraft after several other mishaps. As did every other pilot everywhere, because it's an obvious suicide machine. I'm surprised the autogyro didn't become extremely popular years later with Japanese kamikaze pilots. Uh, in 1932, to dispel rumors that Earhart was uh, not a skilled pilot but merely a publicity figure created by Putnam. Uh, Amelia began planning a solo transatlantic flight from Harbor Grace, Newfoundland to Paris, uh, which would make her the first female and second person ever after Lindbergh to fly solo across the Atlantic. Well, Earhart took off May 20th, 1932 in her Lockheed Lockheed DL-1, five years to the day after Lindbergh began his historic flight. Mechanical problems, uh, adverse weather forced Earhart to land in a pasture near Londonderry, Ireland rather than Paris, but her achievement was undeniable. She still made it across the Atlantic. The National Geographic Society awarded her a gold medal uh, presented by President Herbert Hoover. She's hung out with two presidents now. Uh, Congress award co- or Congress awarded her, uh, excuse me, a distinguished flying cross. You know, awarded uh, both of those things awarded to a woman for the first time. So well done, Amelia. I cannot imagine trying to do something like that alone, especially early in aviation history. Anything goes wrong when you're over the middle of the Atlantic, you're fucked. You hit one rogue Canadian goose, you're done. You're dead. One unlucky lightning bolt, you're fried. You notice a little fuel leak? Maybe it's not even that bad, but you're, you've just, you know, you're in the very middle of the Atlantic? Well, you're going to die. You are going to go into the cold, terrifying depths of the Atlantic uh, and just disappear forever into that mysterious water. Oh, if, I, if I ever crash on a flight, I hope it's on land. I really do. Just, just explode. Just explode an impact and be done with it. I don't want to land in the water and somehow live for another few terrifying minutes Wondering if I'm just going to drown or some just, you know, insanely creepy sea critter is going to eat me. No, thank you. Uh, after this flight, Earhart continues to kick some aviation ass. She goes on to set records and achieves uh, first for females in aviation left and right. August 1932, she became the first woman to fly nonstop coast to coast across the continental U- United States in her Lockheed Vega. Uh, she had the fastest nonstop transcontinental flight by a woman in 1932. 1933. She was one of two women to enter the Bendix race from Cleveland, Ohio to Los Angeles, California. See, they're doing it right this time. Uh, where officials had opened uh, uh, up to women, allowing them to compete against men in the, in the same race for the first time. Although she crossed the finish line six hours behind the men, on her return flight, she beat the nonstop transcontinental flight record she'd set previously uh, by two hours. 
1934, Earhart continued to receive awards and accolades for her record-setting achievements. Uh, she won the Hartman, Harmon Trophy excuse me, as American's Outstanding Airwoman again in 1934 after winning it in 32 and 33. Uh, she was given honorary membership in the National Aeronautic Association and was awarded the Cross of Knight of the Legion of Honor by the French government. That's a, that's a long title. This is the Cross of Knight. Is that of the Legion? Oh, thank, uh, I'm not done yet. Of Honor. Oh, okay. It's the Cross of Knight of the Legion of Honor. Uh, Earhart launched a fashion line in 1934, but did not have success and closed it by the end of the year. You can find old ads for her products, and after looking at some, not surprised it didn't take off. Horrible spokesmodel. Uh, barely smiled. Her hair uh, often looked like it wasn't even combed, and she dressed <laughs> she dressed like a small-town grandpa. Just like a flannel shirt and ill-fitting jeans. Much better pilot than fashion mogul. Uh, she also uh, worked with Paul Mance, a Hollywood stunt pilot and technical advisor, to prepare for a new record flight from Hawaii to California as the first person to fly solo across the Pacific. She received FCC approval to install a two-way radio in her high-speed special 5C Lockheed Vega, first time it was ever installed in a civilian aircraft. On December 3rd, 1934, another pilot and his two-man crew had disappeared attempting to complete the flight from California to Hawaii. Well, in spite of the disappearance and public opinion that the flight was both dangerous and pointless, the Vega was shipped to Honolulu, Hawaii in late December, and on January 11th, 1935, Earhart took off from Wheeler Army Airfield near Honolulu, and a little over 18 hours later, she landed in Oakland, California, setting another record, and then she saw Will Rogers there, and she walked over to him, whipped her dick out, and smacked him across the face with it. How's that for powder puff, huh? All right, hoping to break another record in April 1935, she became the first person to fly solo from Los Angeles, California to Mexico, by official invitation from the Mexican government, but got lost, drifted 60 miles off course, and, uh, and had to stop, according to what I read, had to stop and ask for directions. How does that work uh, when you're flying? Wish I could find out more, wish I could have found out more about her stopping and asking for directions. I just picture her landing in some, like, random Mexican village, just pop, it's, donde esta uh, a ciudad de Mexico? And some dude just points towards Mexico City, and she just hops back in her plane, gracias, just fucking takes off. Uh, in May of 1935, she set a record uh, traveling nonstop from Mexico City to Newark, New Jersey, arriving in just over 14 hours. In August 1935, she flew in the Bendix race again, this time with Mance, and she placed fifth. Did a little better, won 500 bucks. Uh, Earhart then joined the Purdue University staff as a women's career counselor and advisor in aeronautics in 1935 uh, after being invited by university president Edward C. Elliott to lecture at the university in 1934. Uh, in December 1935, Purdue had a conference on women's work and opportunities, and Earhart was the featured speaker. In July 1936, Purdue and other sponsors helped Earhart purchase a Lockheed Electra 10E, which she called her flying laboratory, and she began planning a trip to fly around the world at the equator. And in early 1937, she and Frank Noonan, her navigator, began their first attempt to fly around the world. They flew from Oakland, California, to Honolulu, Hawaii, March 17, 18, but crashed while attempting to take off from Luke Field near Pearl Harbor on March 20th, and luckily, neither was seriously injured. Now, Frank Noonan should probably take a second to learn a little bit about the other person who disappeared uh, with Amelia back in 1937. Uh, Noonan was uh, a recently escaped uh, inv uh, convict uh, who had uh, killed several women in the previous uh, you know years, up before 1937, uh, all of which, you know, well, I say killed, all of them all just disappeared. So uh, it's kind of weird that no one has ever really looked into that angle. Uh, three three women disappeared when hanging out with Frank Noonan uh, in the years 1934, 1935, and 1936. Each, so nine total. Each year, three women would disappear. So, and never looked into. So I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, uh, he was a flight. <laughs> no, I just, I fucking just made that up just now. Of course, that, that's not true. Uh, Noonan was an American flight navigator, sea captain, aviation pioneer. Uh, he was just four years older than Amelia. He was an extremely experienced navigator, charted several commercial airline routes across the Pacific in the mid-30s. In the late 20s, Noonan had learned to fly himself. He was issued a pilot's license in January 1930 in New Orleans. Uh, had worked as a naval navigator for the Merchant Marines, and the training, I guess, translated to working in aviation. He once wrote, The actual navigation was comparable uh, with such as would be practiced afloat. Fixes were determined entirely by stellar observations at night. I mean, what a crazy job that was. Navigating a plane in the days before radar and air traffic control. Navigating by the stars. 
I can't imagine uh, navigation now without GPS, now that I'm used to it. Like if someone was just like, oh, you, you just head east for a few miles, and then you want to turn and head south once you make it to the second ridge over there. What in the hell are you talking about? What, what do I look like, Galileo to you? You find me a computer that tells me how to do every single step of this, and you find it now. Uh, after the plane was repaired at the Lockheed plant in California, they planned a second attempt, an attempt that would be their last, if you're familiar with the story at all. Uh, sadly, Noonan would get married in Arizona in between flight attempts, and the new couple would only spend a few days together before his ill-fated final flight with Amelia. 1937, Amelia Earhart and Noonan, they give it another go. Wouldn't be the first time someone had flown across the globe, by the way. I didn't know that before I looked into all this. Several pilots actually first accomplished that back in 1924, so... It was a team of aviators uh, working for the United States Army Air Service, the precursor of the United States Air Force. And that trip took 175 days, covering over 27,000 miles. Earhart attempted to do it in considerably less time, hoping to complete the journey in around six weeks. And, and she would have been the first female pilot to do it by a long ways. After her disappearance, it would take almost 30 years for a woman to fly solo around the globe in a plane. It would, it would be Geraldine Jerry Mock. Uh, accomplishing the journey on April 18, 1968. Starting on May 21, 1937, from Oakland, California, in the recently repaired Lockheed Electra, she and navigator Fred Noonan stayed over land as much as possible. After relatively short flights to Burbank, California, Tucson, Arizona, they next touched down in New Orleans, then Miami, where the plane was tuned up for the long trip. From Miami, they flew to the Caribbean, to an enthusiastic welcome in San Juan, then to Natal, Brazil, for the shortest possible hop over the Atlantic, although at 1,727 miles, it was the longest leg of the journey they completed safely. Then they touched down in Senegal, West Africa. They flew eastward across Africa to Katorum and then to Ethiopia. From Asab, Ethiopia, they were the first to make an Africa to India flight, a 1,627-mile uh, leg. From Calcutta, India, they flew to Rangoon, Bangkok, and then Bandung in the Dutch East Indies, now Indonesia. Monsoon weather prevented departure from Bandung for several days. Repairs were made on some of the long-distance instruments, which had given them trouble previously. During this time, Amelia had become ill with dysentery that lasted for several days. That sounds fun. After a stop in Darwin, Australia, they continued eastward to Ley, New Guinea, arriving there on June 29th. All this traveling in just over a month's time, man. So much time in a tiny plane. Uh, the Lockheed Model 10E Electra did have a fully enclosed cockpit, so at least they weren't just out there like, uh, like the Red Baron out there in the elements. But still, a very small plane, man. It's just under 40 feet long with a wingspan of 55 feet, max speed, 202 miles an hour, not designed to fly much higher than 19,000 feet ever. Uh, she probably flew a lot closer to 14,000 feet in a lot of her journey. Traveling by those little planes back then compared to traveling on modern planes, especially like commercial flights, that must be like traveling across land by a dirt bike compared to traveling by a big bus. Must have been one hell of an adventure to fly over all that land, looking down at the Caribbean, looking down at South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, India islands of the South Pacific, Australia, flying low enough, slow enough to really take it all in. Uh, from Leigh, they took off from for Howland Island, a long 2,200-mile-away 2, uh, island in the Pacific, and they never arrived. To aid in radio communications, the U.S. Coast Guard cutter uh, uh, it, 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 Itiska uh, was stationed off Howland Island. It's, a, it's kind of a, it makes me want to say Ithaca, but it's I-T-A-S-C-A. Itisca. Uh, the Lockheed Electra took off from Ley at uh, zero Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, eight hours later, she called in to Ley for the first time at 1930. Itisca uh, received the following message. K-H-A-Q-Q -Q calling Itisca. Uh, we must be on you but cannot see you. Gas is running low. An hour later, the last message came in. We are in line position of 157-337. We'll report on 6,210 kilocycles. Wait, listen on 6210 kilocycles. We are running north and south. And then silence forever. Well, the U.S. Coast Guard and Navy scoured the area by ship and plane for two weeks after the disappearance. George Putnam, Earhart's husband, enlisted civilian mariners to continue the hunt. Over the years, enthusiasts have looked for uh, signs of Earhart on her plane and the Marshall Islands, on Saipan, uh, deep underwater. Nothing conclusive has ever been found. No wreckage, no remains. 80 years on, the mystery surrounding her disappearance and the excitement around solving it has hardly waned. Every once in a while, a new clue does come to, uh, to light. A uh, History Channel documentary, for example, revealed an archival photograph showing Earhart and Noonan alive on a dock in the Marshall Islands, hundreds of miles from Howland. Well, what appears to be that. 
It's not definitive, but it very much appears to be them. A 2017 expedition sponsored by National Geographic scoured the island of Niku Mororo, uh, Roru, uh, an island 350 uh, nautical miles away from Howland, where some believe Earhart crash landed. The expedition combed the island with four dogs that specialized in sniffing out deeply buried and ancient human remains. And they came across some interesting discoveries. Uh, you know, but that, but they didn't, they didn't find Earhart. So what the hell happened? Well, let's hop out of this timeline and let's do our best to figure it out. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. The official U.S. position is that Earhart and Noonan ran out of fuel on their way to Howland Island and crashed into the Pacific Ocean. The U.S. Coast Guard cutter Itzika uh, was at Howland to assist Earhart, as we stated, uh, in this pre-radar era by providing radio bearings and a smoke plume. Uh, but owing to radio problems, communication was sporadic and broken. According to Itzika's radio logs, Earhart indicated she must be near the island but couldn't see it and was running low on gas. And then she never made it, of course, to the island. Well, about 15 years ago, Nautis Coast, uh, Nauticos, a Hanover, Maryland company that performs deep ocean searches and other re- uh, ocean research, uh, led an effort to locate Earhart's plane where they believe it crashed in the Pacific Ocean in the vicinity of Howland Island. Well, Nauta Coast President David Jordan said in 2003 that by studying factors such as Earhart's broken up radio transmissions and what is known about the electric fuel supply, he and colleagues had narrowed down an area of the ocean that they believe will eventually yield the plane's grave. We are confident it is in the area we are searching, said Jordan. Of course, we cannot guarantee it, but we are sure it is in the vicinity. Well, in March and April of 2002, the company used a high-tech deep-sea sonar system to search 630 square miles of ocean floor near Howland. They didn't find the plane on that expedition, and they didn't find it later in a 2006 follow-up mission. Then, in 2009, a separate team of explorers, organized by the Waite Institute for Discovery, searched a roughly delaware size area just west of Howland with the help of deep-sea robots, and that search uh, also turned up nada. Still an optimistic Ted Waite, the Waite Institute's president, said in a statement that the results of these searches... Uh, eliminate thousands of square miles from future search efforts. And he still believes a future team will find Amelia's wreckage. Maybe it will, but maybe not. They've scoured the ocean around Howland relentlessly already and not turned up a damn thing. So did she really crash in the ocean? Well, not according to some other popular theories. Here's another theory. This is the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery, uh, TIGHAR has been investigating the hypothesis that Earhart and Noonan landed in their Lockheed Electra 10E, actually did land it on uh, that uh, Nicomaroro Island, a little speck of land 350 nautical miles southwest of Howland, when they couldn't find Howland. The researchers based their hypothesis on Earhart's last radio transmissions. At 8.43 a.m. on July 2, Earhart radioed the Itzika. Again, she did the K-H-A-Q-Q, which is the Electra's call letters, to Itzika. We are on the line 157337. The Istica received the transmission but couldn't get any bearings on the signal. Well, the line 157337 indicates that the plane was flying on a northwest to southwest navigational line that bisected Howland Island. If Earhart and Noonan missed Howland, they would fly either northwest or southeast on the line to find it. To the northwest of Howland lies open ocean for thousands of miles. To the southwest is Nukamororo. Well, uh, the line of position radio message was the last confirmed transmission from Earhart, but radio operators received 121 messages over the next 10 days. Of those, at least 57 could have been from the Electra. Uh, Wireless stations took direction bearings on six of them. Four crossed near the Phoenix Islands, said Tom King, Tegar's senior archaeologist in a previous interview. Most messages were at night when the tide was low. At the time of Earhart's disappearance, the tide of uh, Niku Mororo was especially low, revealing a reef surface along the shore long and flat enough for a plane to land. If Earhart sent any of those 57 radio transmissions, the plane must have landed relatively intact. Well, the uh, the Tigar, uh, T-I-G-H-E-R researchers theorized that Earhart and Noonan radioed at night to avoid the searing daytime heat inside the aluminum plane. Eventually, the tide lifted the Electra off the reef, sank... Uh, or or broke it up in the surf. Uh, the transmission stopped on July 13th, 1937. Other evidence points to Earhart and Noonan's fate as castaways on Niku uh, Mororo. Later in 1937, a British party explored the island with the intent of colonizing it. Eric Bevington, a colonial officer, noticed what looked like an overnight bivouac. He also took a photograph of the shoreline, which includes an unidentified object that Tigar speculates might have been a plane's landing gear. 
1938, the island was colonized as part of the Phoenix Islands settlement scheme, one of the British Empire's last expansions, one of their last attempts at colonialism, and colonists reported finding airplane parts, some of which could have plausibly come from the Electra. In 1940, Gerald Gallagher, the colonial administrator, discovered 13 bones buried near the remains of a campfire. He also found the remnants of two shoes, a man's and a woman's, as well as a box that once held a sextant, a navigation device. The bones were shipped to Fiji, measured, and then subsequently lost. God damn it! Ah, Tigar researchers evaluated the measurements using modern techniques and determined the bones could be from a woman of Earhart's size and build. All right, so now we got that mystery. Never going to find those bones. Why, why, why did they get lost? Uh, Tigar has launched 12 expeditions to Nikura Mororo, since 1989, over the course of those visits to the island, they've identified a site that matches Gallagher's description of where the bones were found. At the Seven site, as it's called, the name comes from the shape of a clearing around it. There's evidence of several campfires, as well as the remains of birds, fish, turtles, clams, indicating that someone ate there. Based on the way the clams were opened and the fish consumed, the heads were not eaten. Uh, this someone was probably not a Pacific Islander. Well, several 1930s-era glass bottles have also been discovered at the site. One of them may have even contained uh, uh, freckle cream, a cosmetic Earhart was likely to have used. Well, Tigar expedition uh, took place this past summer at Niku Mororo, and uh, they deployed four dogs that specialized in sniffing out human remains as deep as nine feet underground and as old as 1,500 years. Uh, Fred, Fred Hibbert, archaeologist in residence at the National Geographic Society, which is sponsoring the canine, said, No other technology is more sophisticated than the dogs. They have a higher rate of success identifying things than ground-penetrating radar. Uh, the dogs, four border collies named Marcy, Piper, Kale, and Berkeley, uh, arrived on the island on June 30th of this year as part of this expedition. Uh, and they alerted at various locations on the island, you know, indicating that they found some kind of human remains, but despite weeks of digging... Uh, nothing related to Amelia's, Rames, uh, Amelia's remains were found, so the dogs were uh, put down, of course. And, you know, deservedly. You know, you do your fucking job, or you get killed if you're a dog, all right? No, they weren't put down, but they didn't find anything. How crazy is that about how powerful these dogs' sense of smell is, right? They can smell the remains of someone who died hundreds of years ago, you know, up to nine feet underground. If my dog Penny's sense of smell is that good, why does she insist uh, on just only using it to locate and then roll in her own shit in the yard? Like an asshole. Uh, my nose couldn't locate a, a cadaver anywhere, and yet the smell of her shit is so powerful it's made me dry heat before I was cleaning, you know, once when I was cleaning it up in the yard. Shouldn't, shouldn't Penny be in a perpetual state of dry heaving, smelling that so much more intensely all of the time? It's so weird to me that dogs can smell so much better than us, but are, but are not even remotely bothered by just powerful stink. All right, another theory. Another theory uh, is that Earhart and Noonan, unable or perhaps not intending to find Howland, headed north to the Japanese-controlled Marshall Islands, where they were taken hostage by the Japanese, possibly as U.S. spies. Now, some believe both pilots were eventually killed, while others believe Earhart and maybe Noonan returned to the U.S. under assumed names. According, according to that theory, Earhart took the name Irene Craig, Craigmile and then married Guy Bolum and became Irene Bolum, who died in New Jersey in 1982. Uh, I don't buy this one. I looked into it a little bit. <laughs> Bolum herself, she got so sick, this poor woman, of people claiming that she was Earhart her whole entire life, that she eventually filed a $1.5 million lawsuit against the author of a book titled Amelia Earhart Lives. It was published in 1970, you know, uh, you know, a little over 10 years before she died. I, I, I highly doubt this theory. Just highly doubt it. Mostly because I've just seen pictures also of, of young Irene, and she doesn't look like Amelia Earhart to me. Uh, I feel like that theory is really reaching, really reaching. Uh, they didn't have advanced, you know, facial reconstruction surgery back then, so it's not like she could have just turned her face into Irene's face. I, I don't buy it. Uh, Ryan Beck believes uh, she was captured, this author, saying if, if, if she couldn't find Howland, plan B was to cut off communications and head for the Marshall Islands and ditch her airplane there. And this is uh, Rollin C. Ryan Beck, a, a retired U.S. Air Force colonel who lives in Kalua, Hawaii, and he claimed that in 2003. In his book, Amelia Earhart Survived, Ryan Book, uh, Ryan Neck, uh, Reinick, Jesus Christ, describes a scenario in which Earhart ditched her plane in the Marshall Islands and returned to the U.S. under an assumed name for national security reasons. According to Reinick, the scheme would have allowed the U.S. government to rescue Earhart in the Marshall Islands and at the same time perform pre-war pre -war reconnaissance on the Japanese. However, the plan went bad, as a lot of plans do, and uh, he thinks that Earhart radioed that she was headed north, the message was intercepted, and then the Japanese took her hostage. 
Well, in recent years, high school science teacher and Earhart enthusiast Dick Spink has picked up Reinhardt, uh, Reinex torch, collecting oral histories from the Mar- Marshall Islands, he says, are proof that Earhart and Newton landed on a tiny atoll named Millie. And no one has taken this seriously because his name is Dick Spink. Did you hear that the first time? Dick Spink. Mr. Dick Spink. If your last name is Spink and your first name is, is Richard, just fucking just go by Richard. How relentlessly are you going to be mocked? At least behind your back, if, you, if your name is Dick Spink. It sounds, like a di- it sounds like something bad has happened to your dick, right? It really does. Like, God, what that, what that, like in a locker room, like, you know, if you take your pants down, and be like, oh, geez, what the hell? What the hell happened to you? Ah, God, it's a Dick Spink. It's got a Dick Spink right on the tip a week ago, and it hasn't faded. Oh, uh, well, uh, the whole world needs to know this, uh, Dick Spink said in a 2015 interview. I heard a consistent story from too many people in the Marshalls to dismiss it. They say she landed at Millie. Our uncles and aunts, our parents and our grandparents know she landed here. Well, the, the Marshallese accounts were so convincing that Dick Spink spent $50,000 of his own money searching for the spot where Earhart has landed. Well, he probably has money to blow. <laughs> it's not like he has a family to spend it on. You, 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 you live alone when you go by Dick Spink. Uh, sorry. He contends that the Islanders' stories will eventually be borne out by scientific proof. And then there's the uh, recently aired History Channel documentary, Amelia Earhart, The Lost Evidence, that claims new connections between Earhart and the Marshall Islands, pointing to a possibly pre-World War II archival photograph of a dock at Jalut Atoll, one of the Marshall Islands, or on one of the Marshall Islands. And then the filmmakers claim uh, this photo contains Earhart and Noonan. The documentary argues that the Japanese Navy thought that Earhart and Noonan were U.S. spies, eventually imprisoning them on the island of Saipan to await either death, uh, to await death by either execution or dysentery. Uh, I saw this footage and I do have to say it's pretty convincing. I saw the photograph, uh, you know, that they're talking about Amelia's back. If it is Amelia, uh, her back is to the camera. Noonan is partially obscured by someone else standing between him and the camera. But the figures, the only two Caucasian figures in the photo do really look like they could have been an Earhart and Noonan. And, uh, you know, the location of the photo certainly makes it possible that they were in that area at the time. And it's not like there was records of other Caucasians being in that area at the time. So I don't know. Uh, it, it does make some sense to me, despite how convincing the photo argument is though. Um, you know, and, and it is convincing again. I even, wa- I even watched some facial recognition experts say that the guy definitely matches Noonan for sure. And that the woman, you know, even though her back is turned is definitely the right size with the right haircut, right clothes being, uh, having, you know, that she's wearing to be Earhart. But many Earhart enthusiasts still dismiss the martial theories outlandish. Uh, Elgin Long, a retired pilot who spent decades researching Earhart's disappearance, uh, he just believes in the, in the, in the, she sank in the ocean. He says the plane would have had to float on a long way to reach the Marshall Islands. And for him, uh, the answer to the mystery rests under 17,000 feet of ocean water. Uh, Fred Patterson, a World War Airways pilot for 25 years, who also owned two Electras, shares uh, Long's opinion. He says, there's just no way she made it to the Marshall Islands. I've done some long range flying in that airplane myself, and I know exactly what it burns per hour. He's talking about, you know, fuel, of course. Patterson Long and many others in their camp argued that radio transmissions place Earhart near her intended destination of Howland Island. And when she uttered gas is running low, you know, the distance from Howland to, to Millia Toll is 800 miles, nearly four and a half hours away at the electric cruising speed. So doubtful. So who knows? Maybe it's, maybe it's bullshit, but it's, uh, you know, it's not like the believers in this theory didn't consider distance possibilities in conjunction with the plane's last known location and, and fuel amounts into their equation. So there's, you know, there's a chance Noonan didn't know exactly where the hell he was when they made their last tra- transmission. Maybe he was off. I don't know. You know, could, could maybe it wasn't as many miles away as, as these other guys thought. I don't know. Until Earhart's wreckage is hauled from the Pacific or found elsewhere, the mystery surrounding her disappearance is just going to continue. Now, now these are the main theories I've shared with you, right? That she sank in the ocean or that she, you know, she made it to this island or she made it to that island, that she may have been, you know, a spy and uh, she may have been captured by the Japanese and executed and uh, she may have, you know, made it back to the, to the U.S. under an assumed identity. Those are the main ones, but there are others. And to explore the other theories, we, we have to venture a little deeper into the web. Uh, we have to examine the musings of the idiots of the internet. Idiots of the internet. 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 In order to really find out what the wackadoodles think happened to Amelia, uh, one only has to type Amelia Earhart conspiracy theory into the search bar on YouTube. And this will lead you quickly to a video called Amelia Earhart, The Truth at Last. I feel like whenever a video ends in The Truth at Last, or The Truth Exposed, or finally, The Truth They've Been Hiding From You, 
Like, you know, you're going to get some, you're going to get some good shit. Uh, the video has a long video description starting off with on this episode of expanded perspectives. The guys talk with Mike Campbell about his new book, Amelia Earhart, the truth at last, the second edition. I love that it's second edition, right? They had like the truth at last. And then, oh shit, we found a little bit, a little bit more truth, a little extra truth. So we're going to put it out again. Uh, nearly everything the American public has seen, read, and heard in the media for nearly 80 years about the so-called Amelia Earhart mystery is intentionally false or inadvertently misleading. Again, you know it's going to be good after this. Everything you've been told is a lie. That's when you think, I've struck gold, idiot gold, bound to be big nuggets, idiot gold in this here thread. Well, the video itself isn't so insane. Uh, isn't so insane as I thought it was going to be. It goes along with one of the theories we've already examined that Amelia was uh, captured by a Japanese soldier to, uh, in prison for being a U.S. spy, that she and Noonan died as POWs. But not all the commenters are convinced. Lee Zimmerman chimes in with some flat earth insanity. <laughs> oh, yes. Love finding me some flat earthers. Uh, he types, this is absolute bullshit. A CIA slash Masonic cover story. Get Eric Dubay on here. Unless you guys are disinfo peddlers, then you definitely don't want him on your show. She was probably off course because of flat earth. Just like the Scott expeditions to Antarctica using globe-based navigation, they were like 30 miles off reckoning every day of sailing. All caps for the every day there. She probably ran out of fuel because they were way off course and nowhere near the target island. Radio communications were cutting out because of their all caps true distance. From Howland Island, all caps again. But that is what they are covering up. This story is bullshit disinfo. Back to lowercase. Campbell said she may have lived up to all caps seven, down to lowercase, years after being captured by the Japanese. Lucky number, all caps seven. Back to lowercase. A hey guys, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Campbell is a Freemason, all caps, liar. Lowercase, what a bloody. All caps. Joke. Wow. So let me get this straight. They couldn't navigate because of flat earth. All right, Joe Zimmerman. Then how do you explain all of the other sailors and pilots throughout the years who have made it exactly where they intended to go using globe-based navigation? Do, do you think that, that, that every single commercial airline pilot in the entire world is part of the Masonic Flat Earth Conspiracy? Right, man, Flat Earth believers, they really are just a special kind of stupid. They truly are. So not only are all of Earth's legitimate scientists part of the Flat Earth Conspiracy, but I guess every shipping captain on Earth, every airline pilot on Earth is as well. You know, because if they navigated based on you know globe technology, according to this dumb shit, they'd never get to where they were going. Joe, 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 please, on the tiny chance that you are listening right now, please take a year off from comedy on the web. Just take a year off, not forever. Just take like a year off and dedicate that year to just, you know, some educational courses, hopefully science, but anything. If not science, anything else, anything else that, that hasn't been self-published and doesn't have conspiracy or Freemason or Illuminati in the title, please read some books, please. Okay, next one. Uh, next one is user, uh, user, S-O-L-X chimes in with complete gibberish under the same video. Seriously, I've, I actually have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, when they type, Amelia Earhart was not beloved by the American people. She was beloved by the American women. She was the poster child of equal rights. Keep her as a mystery and the support of equal rights for the government's sequel, all op opposition to the amendment. Then the additional generated taxes the government made off of women would stand firm. And remember, the strongest opposition to women, equal rights, were women. Even President Franklin's own family. Martyrs cannot be silenced. This is why I feel news media will not touch the story with a 10-foot pole. What in the fuck are you talking about? What? The media is touching this. The media talks about it all the time. And what do you, what are you, what do people even say? How do people see this? Leave this comment. They, they see it show up on the, on the web and think, yes, that is exactly what I wanted to say. Nailed it. Like what? Like, wait, she was beloved by American women and opposed the most by women. Martyrs can't be silenced, but the media won't talk about it. So the story is silent. 
And, and who exactly is getting taxed more? Where are the extra taxes coming from? Man, buddy, you just, you just made Joe Zimmerman look like a genius. And that is saying something. At least Joe is intelligible with his flat earth nonsense. All right. And then user 666777JFK goes full bananas, full bananas, hoping they're just a troll. They type, and I quote to make it very clear that these are not my words. They type, the lying Jews that hijacked the government in 1913 with the Jude Reserve Act can't let these big lies out because people might look into other lies. 1965 immigration change, Kennedy killed by Jews, gas chambers, kosher food scam, 9-11, watch 9-11 missing links, and that's in parentheticals, all the fake shootings in parentheticals, Sandy Hook, etc. Wow. Wow. You just crammed in so much dumb in such a small amount of space. Re- really, all of the shootings, all of the school shootings, every one of them, every single school shooting ever orchestrated by a secret Jewish society, right? We, we may want to make computers and smartphones going forward a lot more expensive. So just complete morons like this cannot access the internet anymore. And by the way, the Reserve Act this idiot is referring to is, is the, rec- the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913. Was a secret Jewish society behind that? No. Paul Moritz Warburg, a German-born uh, Jewish man, was one of its architects. There are a fair amount of Jewish people in banking, but not because of a conspiracy. Actually, it's most likely due to ancient injustice. Seriously, historical origins are complicated. Uh, but some historians seem to suggest that because the Jewish people had a written culture that was widespread, uh, at a time when other ancient, you know, cultures did not, because you know uh, there were Jewish people roving around, so they were they were across more of Europe. Uh, it allowed them to create and enforce written contracts, and and you know and and have them enforced over a greater distance than other cultures could at the time. So you know, don't don't hate the culture because they were successful before your culture happened to be, and and other events. Uh, tilted European Jewish people towards banking, such as Jewish people being prohibited from owning uh, land often in medieval Europe, so they couldn't farm. It wasn't an option. So some of them became moneylenders, bankers, financiers, because during the medieval period, uh, a lot of Christians were banned from lending money at interest because of biblical usury laws. So the Jewish people, you know, were were just able to fill that role. So they, they didn't do any of this out of greedy, control, secret society shit. They did it because, what, you're not gonna fucking take one of the few career options allowed to you? Oh, and yet the myth of Jewish people controlling all the money continues. Uh, man, stop thinking that and meet some actual Jewish people. I know a lot. And honestly, in my experience, most of them are poor that I've met because, you know, most of the Jewish people I've met uh, are also like me in the, in, uh, in the insane entertainment world where it's, where it's hard to make steady money. Uh, I could go on and on about uh, why anti-Semitic stuff is just completely fucking ignorant nonsense, but it doesn't matter. You know, when you, be, when you become the entrenched member of, of the moronic horde, there is very little chance you're coming back. So, so keep thinking what you're thinking, 666-777-JFK. Stay online, man. Actually, actually, you know what? Stay online all of the time. St- I'm, I'm rethinking my, uh, you know, increasing the cost to, to keep you off a computer. No, I want you actually on a computer all the time because the more time you spend on a computer, uh, the less time you're going to have to spread your dumb shit seed into the gene pool and create more disgusting idiots of the internet. So what do I think happened after all this? Honestly, uh, after that photo I you know, talked about for a while, I think maybe she she did land on another island. And then I think that after that, you know, she probably was taken captive by the Japanese who were occupying that area. And she probably was executed for possibly being a spy, right? I don't know. That doesn't seem that outlandish to me. Either that or, or she just disappeared in the ocean. Either one. I mean, sneaking back to America to live a secret life is the most exciting ending. It's the happiest ending. Would make for the best movie or maybe the best happy movie, but I don't buy it. Uh, the Japanese POW slash execution ending actually might mess for, make for the best kind of dark, poignant movie. You know, especially if Amelia Earhart was a spy for FDR, as some people thought, and she just refused to give in to torture, you know, dying a hero. You know, in the movie, she could have some last line, you know, you may have taken my wings, but you'll never take my soul. Something better than that. Uh, <laughs> there were even rumors that Amelia Earhart was part of a, a Japanese propaganda movement. Uh, kind of furthering the the thought that she survived the flight and that she was part of this movement known as Tokyo Rose, 
which was a propaganda movement in World War II where English-speaking Japanese women would spread anti-American propaganda to try to demoralize Allied troops. Her husband, George Putnam, actually actively investigated that possibility at the time, listening to hours of recorded broadcasts you know, as, that were part of Tokyo Rose and just never recognized his wife's voice. Most of the wild rumors uh, start off with the word of one soldier saying that he saw her over in Japan after the war. He saw her here and or he saw her in New Jersey, you know, he saw her on some plane or something, you know, bullshit. People always think, look, well, why would he say that if it wasn't true? Uh, I can answer that because he wanted attention and he lied to get it or because he was delusional. People say crazy shit all the time, including soldiers. Right? They're not immune to that. Just the other week when I was at the Columbus Funny Bone, the bartender and some of the wait staff were talking about how some Looney Tunes stumbled into the bar uh, during my last show just outside the club there and was asking about a job. And then he started talking about how he's in the Marines and he, and he told one waitress that he served in Afghanistan numerous times and all these crazy decorated medals. And then he told another he was just in for a few years and got out. And then he told someone else he was a Navy SEAL. He told someone else that he was a Marine sniper and had the record for the most wartime kills ever. And I guess this dude, I, didn't, I never got to see him. I guess he looked normal when he came in and then he opened his mouth and just pure insanity just flowed out of it. He probably wasn't even in the military. Or if he was, he's not the guy he claimed to be. You know, he probably didn't serve abroad or didn't see much action. He certainly didn't, you know, set the record for most snipes and then talk like a crazy lunatic. But anyways, I, I looked, I, I couldn't find anything that seemed to offer a legit possibility of Amelia living past 1937. Uh, unless it was just for a few years and then she was, you know, executed by, by the Japanese government. And, even, and, and that possibility is almost impossible to ever document because the Japanese destroyed a lot of their uh, military records uh, after World War II. So, you know, if there was a record of it at one time, it's not there now. So, you know what? You believe uh, what you want to believe. Uh, I'm going to believe she was definitely an adventurous badass, man. Uh, her life is is the coolest part of this story to me, much cooler than her disappearance. Man, she saw the glass ceiling of, of her time and she flew her plane straight up and through that shit. Uh, a pretty amazing lady, man. Pretty amazing human. So let's take another look back at her amazing life with some top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Amelia Earhart set numerous flight records. She was the first person to fly solo the 2,408-mile distance across the Pacific between Honolulu and Oakland, uh, California. Also first flight where a civilian aircraft carried a two-way radio. First person to fly solo nonstop from Mexico City to Newark. 14 hours, 19 minutes. First woman to fly solo nonstop coast to coast. First woman to cross the Atlantic in any situation. First woman to fly solo across the Atlantic and so many more records. Definite badass. Number two, while Amelia Earhart never made it completely around the globe, she did come pretty damn close. She made it, you know, uh, over 20,000 miles of her planned 24,557 mile journey, flying east all the way from Burbank, California, all the way back around the south to, you know, around the globe to the South Pacific. Unless, of course, you're a flat earther. Then she, you know what, then she just faked all of it. Number three, she only flew a total of 16 years, but Earhart's aviation legacy has endured long after her death. In an era when most women stayed home and raised kids, she decided not to have kids and to stay outside the home, inspiring millions of other women to follow their own passions instead of just doing what society told them to do. And I feel compelled to say right now that a staying home and raising the, you know, the kids is what you want to do then do that. Let that also be your passion. Don't let anybody tell you uh, not to do that either. You do you, mama. Number four, she never stopped being the adventurous kid who tried to make a homemade roller coaster. And she wrote, you know, the kid that wrote a, a, a wheeled board down a shed's roof. In 1922, she became the first woman to pilot a plane higher than 14,000 feet after only first taking flight lessons a year before. And number five, new info, uh... She was good friends with First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and even inspired Eleanor Roosevelt to take her own flight lessons. Amelia Earhart and Eleanor Roosevelt flew from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore together in 1933. And uh, both of them briefly took the controls of the Eastern Air Transport Curtis Condor plane they were in. Two of the baddest ladies of the 20th century together in the sky. And a little bonus fact, don't get used to me throwing in extra stuff every week, but just today. 2014, another pilot named Amelia Earhart uh, took to the skies to set a world record. The uh, then 31-year-old California native became the youngest woman to fly 24,300 miles around the world in a single-engine plane. Her namesake never completed the journey, but the younger Amelia Earhart landed safely in Oakland on July 11th, 2014. Hail Nimrod! Time suck. Top five takeaways. Well, there you go. Amelia Earhart successfully sucked. Sucked her so hard. Sucked every little bit of that ass-kicking American. 
uh, this Friday in the Suck is, uh, well, it's uh, me. Gonna suck myself. Gonna get flexible enough to suck myself. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you where I came from. Talk about where I grew up. How I decided to get into stand-up you know, many years ago. What has happened since I started stand-up. Talk about how a whole bunch of failure led to what hopefully will be my most successful project. Time Suck. Uh, you're going to know me a lot better after that episode. And that episode will release right at, right the night after Time Suck's first live recording, which will take place at the Hollywood Improv this Thursday night. Still not totally sure what I'm going to suck on in that show, uh, but I w- will release the live recorded episode the following Monday, unless there are some you know uh, unavoidable recording problems and issues, and then I'll and then I'll re-record it solo and release that. Hopefully, the live recording works out and we all get to hear it. Uh, I think I'm going to suck on either Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, or the Wonderland Murders. Both sucks are L.A. kind of area specific, and that just uh, feels right to do something local. Uh, special thanks to Time Suckers Amber Marks, Kendra Elizabeth, Jordy, and any Time Suckers I missed who wanted Amelia Earhart. Huge thanks to Time Sucker and editor Jesse Dobner for editing last week's episode, Heaven's Gate, and taking a peek at this week's as well. He is fantastic, and I hope he sticks with the suck and helps me out for a long time. And now... Let's look back at some previous episodes with some Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. All right, first one, Time Sucker Caitlin Gailey uh, brought in an excellent update to the Mandela Effect episode, Time Suck episode 31. Caitlin wrote in saying, Hello, Captain Time Suck. My name's Caitlin, and I'm an amateur Time Sucker, and I've recently been enjoying your podcast, which I will continue to do. Since we are both keepers of knowledge, I felt compelled to correct something you said in your Mandela episode. You said that a woman who had accused her parents of raping her was later found to be wrong uh, because her hymen was still intact. This is a common misconception held around the world. The hymen is not a barrier like most people think. It's more of an arc uh, that can break from doing like a split, riding a bike, or just leading our, our living our lady lives. You cannot tell if a woman or girl is a virgin by inspecting her hymen because the hymen doesn't work like that. This way of thinking is dangerous because all around the world, women and girls are subjected to virginity tests that could prevent them from getting married, working, etc. But, you know, uh, I need to prove it. You are a learned man, and I need to give you the facts. I cannot recommend enough uh, the YouTube uh, video, Adam Ruins Everything, regarding hymens. Uh, Watch their take on it. I love this podcast. It's a topic that fascinated me for years, and it's actually one of the reasons I'm a social worker today. My ninth grade psych teacher had one person stand in front of the room for one minute and then had them go out into the hallway. He asked us leading questions about what she was wearing and what she had in her hand, etc. And when she came back in the room, we realized we had planted fake memories of what she was wearing in ourselves, or that he had planted in in us, sorry. Uh, I was hooked right then and there. Humans are such amazing and complex, or, or excuse me, humans are so amazing and complex, and I love learning about what makes us tick. Thank you for your dedication to truth and brilliant delivery in every podcast. I have loved your stand-up for years, and I'm so glad to have this podcast. Hail Nimrods, Hyman. Love Caitlin from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Oh, Caitlin from Bucks County. I love that. I'm not sure if you really are from Bucks County or you just threw that in as a reference to me calling uh, Buck County or calling it Buck County in the Iceman episode and then trashing it from just ridiculously just for a joke. Either way, I like it. Uh, false memory syndrome fascinates me as well. Uh, clearly, if you've heard that episode, you know that. Uh, now, regarding the hymen, I, I, I do want to say I was just relaying that it was proved uh, that in this particular case, it proved this woman had not been raped as she had claimed because her hymen was still intact. Definitely not trying to say that if your hymen is not intact, you for sure had sex. So sorry if I, sorry if that was confusing. Um, no, I mean, you can be a virgin. Yeah. As as you said, uh, Caitlin and, and and still not have an intact hymen. Yep. Uh, more rare though, to have a hymen be intact. If you have been having a lot of sex, you know, unless maybe all you've experienced is a micro penis, uh, just speculating there. But yeah, all kinds of stuff can break a hymen, bad fall, random injury, various forms of masturbation, being punched in the vagina by a ninja. Uh, no, all kinds of stuff. But seriously, religious and cultural rituals to prove a woman's virginity, those should just all be abolished. So misogynistic, so fucking barbaric. I mean, you can't prove uh, a man uh, being a virgin. So why are you, why are you trying to, to do it with a woman? Because you see her as property. And that's I don't care if that's part of your religion. I don't care if that's part of your culture. It's fucked. Knock it off. Right, 2017, let's move past that shit. Hail Nimrod Timon. Uh, Time Sucker, member of the U.S. military, Aaron Albright, wrote in with several updates this week. I'd like to share one of them about the Martin Luther King Jr. Time Suck, episode 42 of the Suck. Uh, Aaron wrote in saying, Dan, a.k.a. Most Magnificent Sucker, <laughs> a.k.a. Suck Master Flex, <laughs> a.k.a. The Reverend Dr. Chester Suckington III. 
I, I, those always crack me up so much. What's going on, my sucker from another mother? First, let me say as a 19-year veteran of the U.S. military, thank you for your unwavering support of our heroes that put everything on the line for our freedoms. It means a great deal to us just to hear the words, thank you for your service. And, and, and I do thank you guys for your service so much. And then he says uh, a lot of other nice things because he's a fantastic human being. And then shares a few updates, uh, Aaron does, including this one. During the MLK episode, you mentioned Emmett Till, who was brutally murdered for allegedly whistling at slash flirting with a white woman. Well, get ready for this epic fucked upness. Apparently, his accuser, Carolyn Bryant Donham, lied about the whole thing. It was reported that she admitted to lying about it to Tim Tyson, who wrote the book, The Blood of Emmett Till. I know that Till's family must have been livid when this news came out, especially since her husband and his half-brother... Uh, who murdered Till, were acquitted for the crime. Now 82 years old, I don't know if there will be any repercussions, but I think as punishment, she should have a group of black men wearing t-shirts of Emmett Till, beaten and bloodied body, whistling songs she hates and constantly talking to her until she dies. Won't bring Emmett Till back, but at least she'll be reminded of what she did every day until then. Wow, man, how messed up is that? And this is me talking now. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Man, look, we all make mistakes, but when you make one that directly leads to someone's death, Right, especially that and with the hateful racist overtones that came along with it, and then you, you you had time to take it back, take the mistake back before the person dies, and you didn't, you didn't go wait, 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 don't do anything. It's not true. It's not true. You deserve some vengeance headed your way. I don't care if your ass is eighty two years old. If she really did confess that to that author, I hope she breaks both hips. I hope she gets thrown down the stairs, breaks both hips by someone who's never caught for the crime, but then lives another fifteen years in constant pain and misery in a nursing home bed, being. You know, kind of attended to by nurses who are all African-American and all hate her fucking guts. That, or a less violent thing, or I hope she publicly confesses and then devotes the rest of her life, every minute, every breath, to charities that benefit African-Americans and then leaves everything she has in her will to African-American charities. One of those things, uh, or both somehow. Okay, remember how I said uh, every time I joke about Wiccans, this is the last update, uh, I get some emails. Well, we're going to end on one of those today. A uh, longtime sucker and, and wicked Logan uh, Stenseth wrote in saying, Hola, King of King Suck of the Suckians. Let me just start by saying that I'm loving the diversity of the, in the podcast as time has gone on. Definitely looking forward to some more creepy and dark stuff as Halloween approaches. I do have a scary topic coming up for that. Uh, the main reason I'm messaging the almighty King Suck today is to shed some light on your knowledge or rather lack, lack of knowledge regarding Wiccans. I myself am a practicing Wiccan, and I'm also a huge fan of not only the suck, but of your stand-up as well. I'll start off with saying, not all of us are as crazy as you think. With every belief system, there are extremists, people who believe so much they believe their own bullshit. Every Wiccan or coven you meet will have a different set of beliefs. This is because, unlike a, a, a great many other religions, there is no set belief system. There are general guidelines that we follow, but these guidelines, uh, any decent... These are guidelines any decent person would follow. Some Wiccans believe that the devil exists and worship him. Uh, Some believe the devil to be complete bullshit. I myself worship what I can see, the sun that provides me in the earth with light, warmth, energy, the growth of food, etc. The moon that controls the magnetic fields and energies of the earth and the ground I walk on for it provides everything. I don't talk to the moon or to animals. I don't believe by simply putting a crystal <laughs> on you, it's going to heal you. It's all a personal thing that many people have taken uh, to, you know, too far. All w- Wicca is a modern combination of multiple cultural cultures, shaman, shamanistic beliefs, mainly European, Asian, Native American beliefs. It's all about healing yourself and others and, and the world without, you know, about being in touch with nature. Most believe in karma and reincarnation like how Buddhists do. We're basically a bunch of magical hippies. Also, a little info over the subject when it comes to crystals and broomsticks, when it comes to the crystal healing, the belief is... You know, you put your own energy in the crystal to project it into or onto or on someone else. It, it's supposed to act as a vessel, I guess, in a way. Colors mean different things, which is why, for example, rose quartz is associated with love. You know, so that's how it correlates together very briefly uh, and simply. As for broomstick, it is believed a few hundred years ago a person came up with a witch doing a harvesting ritual, which includes riding a broomstick while dragging on the ground. This symbolizes the harvest and animals dragging the, the ground. It is believed that's where this bullshit legend started. Uh, I'm sure I still could sound crazy, and that's fine, but I just wanted to show you that we're all not as delusional and into ourselves as you may think. You know, we're, we're religion that doesn't look down on others. I may think Christianity uh, is a load of bullshit created by the Romans to control the minds of the naive, but I don't tell Christians they're wrong because if that makes you a better person, then more power to you. I will say this, though. Our religion has never killed someone because they didn't believe in a man in the sky. Just saying. <laughs> he said, ha, ha, ha. Uh, hope I didn't bore you too much. Looking forward to some more intense sucking. Give Bojangles a pet for me. Suck on King. All right, Logan. Well, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate the extra info. I really do. And I and I, you know what? And I do not think you're crazy. 
Uh, I did say all religion is subjective and, and that my point of view, you know, being Wiccan isn't, you know, better or, or worse than being part of any other, you know, spiritual belief system. It's all a matter of faith. I, I was just saying that, that being Wiccan, it's just less mainstream than Christianity is. Therefore, it's more likely to draw members from a crowd of people who are willing to try out more outside the box type ideas than the average Joe. And because of that, you're going to get more extremists in it. I, I firmly believe that still. I have no study to prove that, but I get, I'm guessing someone who is willing to take a chance on being Wiccan is more likely than the, than the middle of the road, you know, Christian to also take a chance on a cult like Heaven's Gate. That's what I was getting at. Not because, you know, someone who's Wiccan is less in, or, you know, intelligent or less or more crazy, but because, uh, you know, being Wiccan, is, it's just more fringe. That's all. You have to work harder to find out about it, you know? Uh, you have to work harder to become Wiccan. You don't, you know, it's, it's very easy in our, in our culture in America to at least call yourself Christian. To be, you know, the church all over the place. Easy to find. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen a Wiccan church, right? You got you to gotta seek that shit out. I don't even know if they have a church. And again, again, I clearly don't know a lot about it, but I do know I've just never, you know, passed by a building that was like, all Wiccans, get in here. You know, and when you have to work harder to get to get into something, I think you're just more likely to be invested in it than somebody who just has a casual interest. It's just showing up because their parents are showing up, which, you know, happens in other more major religions. So I, I, I just think there's going to be a higher percentage of like diehard Wiccans than there is going to be, a, a, you know, an Wiccan extremist than there is going to be like, you know, for example, Christian extremists. That's all. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. You spell cast and broomstick ride motherfucker. No. That was too much on, on purpose. That was too much on purpose. That was a joke. No, seriously. Uh, wicking away, my friend. Get after those crystals. I don't know. I'm not going to try and stop you. You know, I uh, do do just like, as you said, if it makes you a better person, you know, I agree, man. If it makes you a better person to believe that stuff and that's what helps you get through life, then fucking go for it. I'm just glad you're also a member of this cult, the cult of the curious. Glad we can all learn about fun stuff together, man. Wiccans, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, atheists, agnostics, conservatives, liberals, wackadoodle pseudo libertarians like myself whatever i am thanks for listening thanks for writing in thanks time suckers i needed that we all did all right have a great week everybody if i miss some updates that happened uh more recent to the show just i i recorded this one very early in the week just i had to because of some travel situations so uh i will get to the uh updates if, if some stuff is coming through uh, that just happened in the news, for example, I'll get to it on the next suck. Uh, and follow the suck on social media at Time Suck Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Stay curious. Don't fly solo over the South Pacific in a prop plane from the 1930s. Don't let all this crazy current political shit going on divide us. Liberals, conservatives, everyone else, you know, we can get along, can't we? I think so. I do. I do think so. We're all just trying to get by and have some fun and take care of our families, you know, on this big old rock we call home, wicking or not. We're just trying to get through the day. And for the sweet love of Bojangles, you keep on sucking.